It's time once again for Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist Mae Brussel, who for five years has shared with us her extensive research into political assassinations and abuses of power in this country. Her program relates the news of the week to emerging evidence about the conspiracy which allegedly maintains by force its control over the legislative, executive, and judicial processes in America. And now, Mae Brussel. Good afternoon. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. It's Dialogue Conspiracy number 235, and it's September the 20th, 1976. Before we get on to the main part of the broadcast today, I want to announce for our own local uh, news here that there's going to be a showing this Wednesday at the Golden Bough of a movie called The Two Kennedys. It has opened up in Los Angeles, and it got very good reviews. And uh, as a national movie, I imagine that a lot of the news media will be suppressing this movie. And we're fortunate enough to have it up here. Dialogue Conspiracy uh, is, is familiar to many people. Uh, it's an ongoing critique of the Kennedy assassinations, John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and also Martin Luther King and the murders related to these political crimes. But now somebody from Italy has made a movie version of his interpretation of the Kennedy assassination specifically. It goes into those two, and it does involve names that I've used on Dialogue Conspiracy before, such as Marilyn Monroe and Jimmy Hoffa and Mr. Marcel in New Orleans and the, the organized crime that linked with the Central Intelligence Agency in the 60s as part of an assassination team. Uh, you also hear, see Hubert Humphrey and uh, political persons are named and even the suggestion that the U.S. uranium interests and uh, American political figures were involved in standing to gain after John Kennedy was killed. Of course, the movie goes on the premise that the Warren Report lied to the American people or people around the world, and of course I agree on that. And uh, it's a good movie. I know somebody who went to see it and took his tape recorder to take down the dialogue so that he would have it for future research. And I'll be seeing it on Wednesday. I can't say too much about it until I do see it with you, and then... Uh, we can talk about before the second show. Before the first show, I'll go into a little background of the Kennedy assassination for about 30 minutes on the conspiracy that keeps cropping up. And today in Dialogue Conspiracy, I'll talk at length about the new investigations that can be opened up, hopefully, in the House of Representatives. But this, this movie should be very interesting because the network of people from organized crime to oil people to the CIA to the anti-Castro Cubans is not just some general net thrown over a whole era. There are various researchers like myself who name these people, who name where they met, where the money was transacted, how much money, where the final go-ahead went for the assassination of John Kennedy, where the plans were made to kill him that day, and two other attempts uh, were planned in November but didn't get off, and so he was killed in Dallas. I'll talk a little bit about that, and then we'll see that movie. So... If you have any questions that you want me to answer there in that short time that you have on your mind about the Kennedy assassination, maybe I can answer those in person, and I'll see you at the Golden Bow. at 7 o'clock Wednesday night, this Wednesday, and at 10 o'clock for the second showing in Carmel, California. And for those of you that hear this program that don't live in Carmel, ask your theater to carry the movie called The Two Kennedys. It's available for you in your own local community and see it yourself, and then um, encourage other people to see it so that we do get a, a different view of the one that the Warren Report told us about the day that John Kennedy was killed. I do would like to continue today to talk about the murder of Robert Hall, that private detective in Los Angeles who died July 22, 1976. Two weeks ago on Dialogue Conspiracy, I talked about Robert Hall, and the murder of rock musicians and the link of drugs and, to rock music. And I'm writing an article for a national magazine on that subject, the one I did on KLRB two weeks ago. And then last week I went at length into the links of Robert Hall to Robert Vesco and Howard Hughes and to a Century City financier in Los Angeles by the name of Thomas Richardson. And this case is wide open in terms of to be investigated, to be prosecuted, to be covered up. It's as big as the Watergate story. It's a part of the Watergate story. 
There's no news coming out, no Associated Press, no United Press on the story, even though it'll be two months since Robert Hall was murdered. But they're individual articles, and uh, they link to the U.S. Summa Corporation and that famous burglary at Summa Corporation in June 75 and another burglary in April 75 at their office in Encina out in Van Nuys in California. And I'll talk some more about Robert Hall next week, but this week I want to get into the matter of the Kennedy assassination because Congress uh, just voted a new resolution to open up the Kennedy assassination. Uh, one more thing before I do get to that, I did get a request and several telephone calls from somebody living in the Sacramento area that listens to our program on KZAP and asked me to sp spend a few minutes talking about Harry Reams. He's the man who starred in Deep Throat and uh, some of you may wonder why worry about a star from a pornographic movie and where does this fit into the assassination of the Kennedys or Martin Luther King. There's a very good connection to uh, the harassment of certain people in the pornographic field that are making these movies and against the other ones that are allowed to make them. It's no different than busting 500 people at the rock concert of Pink Floyd and then a month later not bothering to bust any person at Elton John's concert uh, where grass is, and drugs are as prevalent as they are at the one concert. The selectivity of the police department is important. And also, the killing of John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy or Martin Luther King or maybe the one or 200 or 300 deaths that followed them is for the purpose of more repression. We're going in that course now. If you read your newspapers every day, there's something more frightening coming along. And you read about the newspaper people uh, being locked up in jail and also, uh, the pornographic field has been touched by this in the sense that it becomes a landmark case by the Supreme Court. Richard Nixon was removed from office from the White House, and the powers that be <coughs> made sure that he uh, had some good appointments before he left on the Supreme Court. One of them was Mr. Rehnquist, uh, who with his CIA wife is practically rewriting many of the decisions on the Supreme Court now. And one of their big decisions was the question of pornography, and they passed uh, a decision that pornography should not be prosecuted as a blanket charge in 50 states that a individual state, an individual state, could decide for themselves if they want to prosecute somebody if it doesn't meet the taste or the standards in your own state. So in July 1974, Harry Reams was arrested in New York City. He was living in New York City, and he was taken off by the great Federal Bureau of Investigations to Memphis, Tennessee, where he was convicted of what they called a national conspiracy. There were 12 persons and four corporations that were found guilty of distributing the movie Deep Throat, and he, he was convicted uh, May 76. The convictions came down. It was in 74 that he was carted away. Now, Reams was paid $100 for that great movie. The movie has made over $25 million so far. He got a flat rate of $100 for the entire job. That's all he was ever paid. The movie Deep Throat was made in January of 1972. But when the Supreme Court changed the law, Deep Throat was in trouble. It wasn't against the law to make the movie at the time they made it. But with the new uh, law of the Supreme Court, the movie uh, becomes in jeopardy and they've gone after the particular actor. The Justice Department contends that even if the act that the man Reams was accused of was legal, where he committed it, he can go to jail. Now, this is very important because you can make a pornographic movie in California, and it can show in 49 states, and a lot of people can make money off that movie, such as Deep Throat, for $25 million so far, and then will go towards $50 million before it's through. But even though it's illegal in the state where he made it. If the film is sent to a state where it's illegal to show it, then he can go to jail, and this is what happened. If it's made in California and it's shown in Tennessee, Reams can be brought to Tennessee on a conspiracy statute. And I don't have to go much farther for you to see the danger that uh, this gets into in terms of movie censorship. There's no safety in any place you make the film because it can be sent to any state. And once you make it, somebody that doesn't like you can make sure that it gets to that state so that you're locked up and put you in prison. 
the other actors in the movie and uh, the director and Linda Lovelace, the famous Linda Lovelace, and the theater owners and the mafia that distribute it, that are in pornographic business, were not prosecuted at all. They're not named in the suit, and Harry Reams was taken away. The trial record illustrates that the judge hoped that this prosecution would, he said in quotes, deter other actors from accepting similar parts. So what that means is that in Memphis, Tennessee, a judge can make sure that no actor takes a pornographic role anymore, if that's what he wants to do. Because all you have to do is put that film in one can and ship it to that state and then put the actor in prison. Um, now, what is the opinion of obscene in Tennessee? How does it affect 50 states? How can one say, set the standard for 49 other states? And how can one city set the standard for every other city in that state. I just read an article in the San Francisco Chronicle today that the uh, senior citizens, 70 and older, decided they would go downtown to see a pornographic movie. I think Alice in Wonderland and a couple of pornographic movies. These women, men are older, and they decided to get some kicks out of life. And if older citizens in California and San Francisco want to see it, and uh, senior citizens down in Azusa or Orange County don't want to see it, uh, who's to decide that one city is going to set the standard for the whole United States? I, it's so horrendous that it boggles your mind, and except for the Berkeley Barb or Vanguard or the LA Pre Free Press, there isn't much written about this yet. No actor and no actress uh, can be protected anymore by the majority of the country, by the majority opinion in the country, and the majority in a democracy is supposed to decide the taste uh people can decide for themselves their taste so that by dictating what one judge says or what his fears are what his anxieties or his sexual frustrations or his hatred for this kind of thing one judge is now dictating for 49 or 50 other states the prosecution of reams has already cost the government more than a million dollars um, i'll read you later i wanted to read a quotation of bf sisk who begged the Congress last week not to open up the Kennedy assassination. He pleaded, uh, for goodness sakes, don't save money. He said, if you have any respect for the dollars of taxpayers, let's vote this resolution down. That's B.F. Sisk on the floor of Congress pleading not to open the Kennedy and the Martin Luther King assassination. Um, what Mr. Sisk didn't say is that Congress spent a million dollars last year for plants in their offices and we can go into congressional expenses. The point is that the state has already spent, the government has spent more than a million dollars prosecuting Reams. For a movie that made $25 million and the major actors and producers aren't held, it grossed more than $25 million already. Uh, Linda Lovelace wasn't asked to testify. She didn't come down to Memphis, Tennessee. Mr. Reams could face five years in prison and five to $10,000 fine but that isn't all. Now, after his prosecution in Memphis, he's been charged in another state. So he can go to South Carolina and get the same charge so that he can end up with no money and spend his entire life in jail because he made $100 making this movie. Uh, his part in that movie, as I say, was 25 months before the film ever was distributed. He didn't know where it was going to be distributed, and at the time the federal charges were brought against him, uh, it was not obscene in many other places. Now, certain actors and a writer have come to his defense, Warren Beatty, Jack Nicholson, Chuck Ashman, who has a radio program in L.A. and who writes. They're trying to help him because they can identify that if they make a movie such as Brando's Last Tango in Paris and that movie shows down in South Carolina and the judge says that's obscene, they could take Marlon Brando and put him in jail and say in our city, that's obscene and charge him with a conspiracy. So this law affects every actor and every author in the United States, and you could take the actors out of the play Equus, who are on the stage nude, and uh, have a love scene there on the stage nude, and take them across straight lines and charge them with conspiracy. The federal judge would not allow any of these actors that were involved to testify any more than they would Linda Lovelace, he said their testimony is not pertinent. In 1973, the Supreme Court judge, as I say, that the future local community standards would guide all movies. 
This was their statement. Let the hometown decide. Use your judgment. That was the Supreme Court judgment. But what they didn't have in there is that you don't prosecute uh, the actor and take him out of his apartment in New York City and put him down in jail in Memphis, Tennessee, and spend a million dollars prosecuting him. If they don't like the movie in their own town, they can stop somebody from having a projection in that part of town. But the the boundaries of the Supreme Court decision have jumped too far over in this case. Reams started to have trouble with his movie, and this is interesting because you say, well, why Reams and why not uh, Linda Lovelace? Why'd they pick Harry Reams? Maybe it would be better explained if I told you one of his first sex movies was called Sex Life of a Cop. The, the federal authorities were incensed at the time he made the movie, and he showed the policeman, the off-duty man in blue, and uh, he took the book publishers into court. He was taken into court. And in the West Coast, the, where the book originated, he got a lot of hassle. <clears throat> the federal authorities were stuck with this, and they didn't like it, and I think they were after him. After that, in 1959, um, the postmaster passed a new law about movie and magazine and libel for prosecution in the city of, or of its origin. So I guess he was just a little... Uh, too courageous making a movie or, or too adventuresome in making a movie on the sex life of an off-duty cop, a pornographic movie. And that probably is where it was decided to get Harry Reams as a scapegoat and not some other actor who is making a, a sexy movie, but it has nothing to do with law enforcement. The law enforcement are, are so cling and they don't like movies done about them. Uh, I suppose that if anybody makes a movie of those 16 cops in Los Angeles having sex with the Girl Scouts, um, they'll come down on that actor who plays those cop or one of the cops. Or I read last week about in New Orleans a sex orgy of another Boy Scout troop, a scout master and assistants. And this time it was boys 11 and 12, 11 to 12 years old. There are 24 boys involved. And they were making commercial pornography films about the boys. These were scout leaders. The other were Los Angeles policemen with girls age 15 to 18. So uh, these things uh, happen, and they, they're not charged. The Los Angeles policemen were charged. They said it wasn't rape. It was free sex. And the Boy Scout and the Scout Master, I'm sure, will get off of their pornographic movies. But if they made one about the cops, then they'd be in the same position as Harry Reams. So all the Justice Department has to do now is to find a conservative community and charge a conspiracy and get a conviction. So uh, this this case has been described by various writers and people who have gone into it as, in quotes, a continuation of the Civil War. And, of course, those are the words that I've used since John Kennedy was killed. That the South is going to take over our Pentagon, our intelligence community. Mr. George Bush have the CIA and people from Texas running very many aspects of our life in Florida and Muscle Shoals, Alabama. We have an intelligence community that is centered in the Southwest and the case against Harry Reams was called a continuation of the Civil War. And as I say, once if they do get an acquittal, he can be charged for the same crime in a different state. Now, usually when you're charged for one crime, uh, that's it. If you get a conviction on another crime, they run concurrently, or you don't get charged twice with the same crime. But in the case of pornography, in this matter, he can be charged in every state every year of his life. So I suppose that Harry Reams is just going to have a lifetime of harassment against him. In 1973, quite a few years ago already, it's going into 77, I wrote an article in The Realist called The Senate Select Committee is Part of the Cover-Up. And in that, I said uh, that at a time when Deep Throat was making millions of dollars, which indicated a desire for the taste of free adults to choose their own entertainment, the Supreme Courts were just about uh, clamping down to dictate what we shall see and what we will read, that Nixon's Supreme Court is a worse danger to our liberties than sexual pleasures. I put that a few years ago in uh, The Realist, and I mentioned Deep Throat because of the harassment that the Supreme Court could do and would start doing. And I said that we have the right to free see whatever movies we want and to read what we want, and that the purpose of studying the political assassinations was to try who, and find out who's doing the oppressing all along the line and stop it before it gets worse. The purpose of doing these murders is to gain control and control our minds like Hitler did in Nazi Germany. So in 1974, 70, 
73, it was summer of 73, I mentioned specifically Deep Throat and the problem of the Supreme Court. So it doesn't surprise me that Mr. Harry Reams was taken out of his own apartment in New York City and then prosecuted and convicted in May of 76, because that's the way the cookie crumbles. The individual who gets involved in these fun-making movies can't see any link of himself or herself to these assassinations. But there are links, and the matters do come to a head uh, too late sometimes, but maybe people will help Harry Reams. There's going to be a dinner party, a fundraising in San Francisco soon. I don't have the date. I was called about it, but you can read your papers. And it's a shame, uh, after getting $100 for the movie, that the movie colony doesn't support his defense fund. They again go to poor people like you and me and the young people listening to defend Harry Reams. And it seems to me the the same movie stars that want to go testify uh, that are making one and two million dollars a picture could help them instead of pushing it onto us. But that's the fact. Uh, they're doing it, and we should object to what's happening and come to some conclusions about whether we like this or not and what we're going to do about it. Well, this week, jumping now to the John Kennedy assassination and away from Deep Throat, the House of Representatives voted 280 to 65 to look into the John Kennedy and the Martin Luther King assassination and other cases. They left this wide open, and I suppose you think that after doing research for 13 years, I'm jumping for joy, but I'm not, because as soon as I read the newspaper articles about the committee, and I know who is putting uh, the work together back east on reopening this committee, uh, I feel that we're being offed one more time, and I want to share that with you and share my feelings with you and the reason I feel that. I don't believe the Congress of the United States, as it's set up now, is capable of investigating the political assassinations of the 60s or 70s. Now, that doesn't mean that the truth about where Lee Harvey Oswald was when the shots came or about the, his autopsy or the doubles of Lee Harvey Oswald or Jack Ruby doesn't mean the truth of these things can't be known to the American population. Because I believe the day will come when almost everyone in the United States, out of 200 million people, will know about the conspiracies except the handful of people that we're paying to investigate it. So we just keep writing books and get on radio shows and inform you about what happened. But that doesn't mean the Congressional Committee is going to investigate it. Too many members of Congress were selected by the CIA or concealed sources of money. And I'm very pessimistic that they're capable of opening it because I think they're bought out a large group of them, such as uh, Gerald Ford and a list of 30 congressmen that was in Playboy last month. There was a list of men funded by the U.S. Medical Institute, which is a tax ripoff to fund political candidates. Uh, these 30 people were named, including the President of the United States, Gerald Ford. There wasn't a whisper about this article. There was no campaign issue. There still isn't. Mr. Mondale gets uh, money from this kind of secret funding. He doesn't talk about Watergate. Jimmy Carter isn't cling either with his money from uh, Mr. Andreas, who funded the Watergate. I'll do some details on the Carter story later. But I don't think that passing a resolution on this matter is going to stop uh, what's happening with the intelligence community funding people in Congress. The Gulf oil uh, exposures were supposed to open up investigating you, Scott, who was the biggest spokesman for President Nixon at the time of Watergate, you Scott was giving money to various congressmen. And this last week, mysteriously, the Gulf oil money investigation was closed. Now, what's wrong with this resolution that they passed this week uh, as of September the 15th or so of 1976? Well, the first place, Representative Downing from Virginia made the resolution, asked for the resolution, along with Mr. Henry Gonzalez from Texas, and Congress appointed uh, Carl Albert, Speaker of the House, appointed Mr. Downing to head the investigation. <clears throat> now, Downing is retiring in November after the first of the year. He's not running for office. And this congressional season officially closes in October. Uh, they said they may have to work day and night for the next few weeks, but they close in October because many of the people in Congress now are running for election this coming uh, election, and those that aren't running are out there supporting their own party. And then after um, they're out, they're running and campaigning till November. There's Thanksgiving recess and there's Christmas recess two weeks in December. The elections are in November, and then a whole new Congress comes in in January. And this resolution, as it stands, is only for this short period of time. And the man who's heading it won't be back 
in the January, so you have a whole new head, a whole new group of people, and some members of the 12-member uh, panel won't be there, won't be reelected. So they're very graciously allotted to the American people approximately two weeks to get into the Kennedy assassination, two to four weeks to get into it. Um, the Black Caucus wanted the case open because of new information on Martin Luther King, which I'll go into. But Congressman Downing gave another great quotation this week. He said, I am convinced there was a conspiracy involved in killing John Kennedy. I don't know the identity of the conspirators or their motives, but it should be investigated death. He assured the American people and the Congress that voted 280 to 65 that there would be no witch hunts. And he said no, there will be no effort to blame those who conducted earlier investigations without the benefit of information now available. Now, we know that's Gerald Ford because uh, Gerald Ford was on the Warren Commission. And I don't think it's a witch hunt to get Gerald Ford to explain why uh, he didn't put in his book from the very first meeting that he was on the Warren Commission that he had access to information that Lee Harvey Oswald was a member of the CIA as well as an agent for the FBI. He mentioned in his book the FBI. He didn't mention the CIA. Now, Don Downing, Representative Downing, said there's certain points he wanted to go into. One was that the CIA withheld information about the plots to kill Castro. Now, that is just a big smokescreen because there's absolutely no documentation that Lee Harvey Oswald was in Cuba with Che Guevara and Castro. And then Schweiker went on to talk about the circumstances of that famous threatening note that Lee Harvey Oswald was supposed to leave at the FBI office uh, saying that he'd blow up the police department just prior to the assassination. This is a non-existent note. James Hostey flushed it down the toilet. He was never fired for destroying the evidence. Gordon Shanklin, his FBI boss, said he was never aware that the note existed. And then Schweiker said they wanted to go into the ties between Jack Ruby and the mafia and the Cubans, meaning the Castro Cubans. So this uh, organization, uh, this congressional committee, I call it an organization because it's really the CIA, is going to have an investigation into a subject that already has so much evidence that it would be easy to find out who killed John Kennedy and the motives and why. But this new committee isn't going to do it. They also want to go into the question of Martin Luther King because a black policeman by the name of Edward Reddit, R-E-D-T-I-T, uh, who was in charge of security for Martin Luther King, was told about four in the afternoon to go home and not guard Martin Luther King because there was a threat on his life. And then two firemen we were removed from their posts that were right next to the Memphis, uh, Tennessee Hotel that Martin Luther King stayed at, the Lorraine Motel. The firemen came from that police station behind the hotel, and the personal guard, the policemen that would have guarded Martin Luther King, were both under the sponsorship of a man named Frank Holloman, H-O-L-L-O-M-A-N, 25 years with the FBI, and he worked with J. Edgar Hoover, and he was aware of these memos against Martin Luther King that J. Edgar Hoover had. And after 25 years with the FBI, he moved to Ten Memphis, Tennessee, where he had authority over both the fire department and the police department. And these particular agents were removed, and Martin Luther King was killed. And then Mr. Holloman, 25 years with the FBI, was in charge of the investigation of the assassination of Martin Luther King. So... Uh, now that these names have been given, and Mr. Edward Reddit uh, has spoken about his not being allowed to guard Martin Luther King and being off duty, the, this information was shown to members of the Black Caucus at, con in Congress, and they have asked for an opening into the case of the Martin Luther King assassination. This is three people that were uh, off duty at the time Martin Luther King was killed, and in the course of my research into the John Kennedy assassination, I had 12 top men that worked with Captain Fritz of Homicide that were totally in charge of all the incriminating evidence to be used against Lee Harvey Oswald when John Kennedy was killed that would protect the FBI and CIA. And all of these people were home or out to lunch November 22, 1963. I've read them before on KLRB, and I can go over them again sometime. But the important thing is that all the persons who went to Lee Harvey Oswald's rooming house or went to his wife's house without a search warrant or picked up the shells to the gun or the paper bag that the gun was supposed to be in. 
and went to his rooming house on Beckley Street. All of these people were home watching TV, which was no different than in Memphis, Tennessee, where a man in charge of Martin Luther King went home and told to go home, and then Martin Luther King was killed, and this gentleman was called back afterwards. Uh, the men in case of uh, John Kennedy assassination, I believe, were there on assignment. It was an important day in Dallas. They should have been protecting the president. If they're important enough to be in charge of all the incriminating evidence and testimony against uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and to solve the Kennedy assassination, they should have been protecting him that day. Well, when I read about the efforts of not having a witch hunt of opening the cut, Congress, uh, by this large vote with two to three weeks to do the work, I called Washington, and I received a call from Congressman Downing's office, and they wanted a resume on two pages of the work that I had done on the Kennedy assassination. And you know how hard it is for me to condense matters anyway, unless I absolutely have to. It is an insult, uh, really, to condense 13 years' work into two pages, which could be done, but I didn't think it was right. So I wrote uh, what I called suggested guidelines for the investigation into the Kennedy assassination, John Kennedy, Martin Luther, Reverend Martin Luther King. And I wrote up a 14-page uh, suggestion of how to conduct the investigation. Now, I know the staff isn't going to do my suggestions because they're not really looking for the truth, but I had 50 copies made to send to the various radio stations where I do uh, talk shows where they call my house, and I know the announcers, so that they have a gauge to guide this new investigation as it works as compared to what the real truth is and how you come to truth. So I want to read you uh, the summary of the suggestions I made to this new committee, and then if I have time, I'll go into the points at length. These are the suggested guidelines that I sent to the congressional committees and members of Congress and various people in the news media this week. Uh, I said there should be no time limit on the inquiry into the Kennedy assassination. They've allowed themselves three weeks, as I say, and maybe in the fall in January when Congress gets together again. But I have the volume number, volume 5, page 100, where Gerald Ford with uh, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover both agreed that the hearings would be open for all time. So I don't know what this monkey business is of two to three weeks before the end of this Congress in an election year. I said, number one, the researchers should present to the investigative committee a full report on all witnesses who've been killed or missing since November 22, 1963. It's impossible to write about the political assassinations until you know who isn't alive or around anymore, because when you talk about a subject, uh, Mr. Uh, Morgan, the CIA attorney, can get up and give his information about what John Rosselli said. But if Mr. Harvey is dead and Mr. Sheffield Edwards and Mr. Rosselli and Mr. Giacana, what makes a CIA lawyer the right authority to speak for these four dead people when they were involved and the things that they had to offer were in direct conflict with what Mr. Morgan said? In the case of the Kennedy assassination, uh, uh, there are people who died, who saw one Oswald leave the back of the school book depository like Mr. Worrell, and Sheriff Craig saw him go out of the front of the depository, and there were two Oswalds in the building. The ru- uh, both those men are dead. The bus driver that said Oswald was on the bus with him is dead. A Mrs. Blesdo who said she saw Oswald on the bus and recognized him as a potential boarder, she's dead. Arlene Roberts is dead. The rooming house lady that heard the police car honk and wait for Oswald, she's dead. And the cab driver, Mr. Whaley, is dead. So what you're left with is a CIA staff lawyer telling you what happened in Dallas without telling you who was dead. So the very most important thing to me is for the researchers like Penn Jones in Texas or myself or Sherman Skolnick and other researchers, Ted Gandolfo, to present a full report on every witness that was killed or missing so that the 12 panel member knows who they're speaking about and who can't speak for themselves. The second point I wrote about was that there should be a list of all major pieces of evidence that were destroyed since November 22, 1963. So that if somebody testifies that the shots came from the upstairs school book depository and that Oswald was working with a Castro Cuban, uh, we have to let the committee know how the car interior was destroyed, how John Connolly's clothing was destroyed, a street sign was destroyed, Oswald's 
uh, passports and CIA papers were destroyed the night of the assassination and the street sign was removed that day or crucial frames were taken out of the film of Abraham Zabruder when Kennedy was killed. In order to come to opinion of uh, how John Kennedy was killed, and you're going to try and blame it on Fidel Castro, he must have had an agent in every ballistic department, every photographic lab, every police department in Dallas, every agency of the FBI. And before you get into the subject of these murders, just list the evidence that's been destroyed so that the people know how much the federal agencies uh, did, like cutting off the sleeve of the coat of Robert Kennedy after the autopsy said the shots came from behind and up. The third point I made is that Representative Henry Gonzalez uh, will head the new committee if it is formed in January. And there is no way to have a committee started unless you have confidence in the person who's heading it. And I, as a researcher, want Gonzalez to be the first witness to testify after we talk about the murders and the evidence and explain which Secret Service agent came to his apartment and picked up the clothing of John Connolly and had it dry cleaned. I can't rest on um, any investigation or the people investigating until I know why this man was selected to take the clothing out of Dallas, Texas, to his apartment in Washington, D.C., and from there it was dry cleaned. The fourth thing I put in this um, guideline, suggested guideline, was to present a list of witnesses that were put in mental hospitals or prisons as a result of what they knew about the John Kennedy, uh, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King murder. And this is important because there was a plan to kill John Kennedy at the football game in Dallas, not in Dallas, in Chicago in November, November the 1st, and it was called off because John Kennedy was home. It was a weekend DM, was murdered in Vietnam. But the point is this, if an agent of the Secret Service, Abraham Bolden, was locked up for saying that there was this conspiracy, and if the intelligence community is going to try to squeeze in a Castro plot out of this, let them explain why there was an assassination plan in Miami, why there was one in Chicago previous to the John Kennedy that involved somebody named Lee Harvey Oswald or Oswald in Chicago. Uh, find out why Abraham Bolden was locked up or put in prison six years or other people locked up and put in prison. Because, again, uh, they have a story to tell, and what they tell will direct the committee in Washington away from a a uh, combine of organized crime with Castro Cubans and take it back to the Defense Intelligence Agency. Another matter that's important before these committees go into the assassinations is to make the record clear by presenting the list of six researchers or more that were blackmailed by the FBI and the CIA. This list was kept by Hale Boggs of Louisiana and it was turned over to his wife and family because there are a group of researchers that were doing very good work early after the John Kennedy assassination and then became very quiet, got out of the scene, or published nothing or said nothing or divided the other researchers. They became professional dividers, uh, splitting one against the other, identical to the COINTEL program. And unless we know which people were followed or blackmailed, I don't have to know what sexual acts they were doing, and whether they were doing of their own sex or different or how many were involved, I've already heard some stories. Uh, unless we know how people can be silenced or controlled through blackmail, we can't understand who is going to head this inquiry or how they get the clout they do or why they keep it at a low-level uh, conspiracy where they say we're not looking for names or it is important who, ki who was killed. It's important who was killed, it's important where the evidence is, and it's important who was blackmailed. And before one witness is really called to testify, I think these things have to be cleared up. The next point I made was that every researcher who spent 12 years on the John Kennedy assassination or eight years on the Martin Luther King assassination or the Robert Kennedy assassination should be allowed to go to every hearing in Washington, D.C. and be given some money as a member of the staff to hear the testimony because there's no way that a staff of 12 people Six Republicans, four Republicans, four Democrats, and four from the Black Caucus can ask the right questions or recognize if there's perjury. They're going in there, they're waking up in 1976, September 1976, and all of a sudden discovering that there's been some conspiracies they never heard about before. So you know how knowledgeable these people have to be. They're going to be on the committee, including, I understand, our Representative Talcott from California is going to be on that committee. But how can they ask the right questions, and how would they know 
like if they have a witness on the stand like Frank Sturgis, and he says that he was in Cuba with Jack Ruby and Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, how would they know that that was outright lie, that it was a perjured piece of testimony, even though Frank Sturgis is writing a book on the matter? Because Sturgis has worked with the CIA for 21 years and was grateful for his citizenship. He was in a bind to get that. How do they know to write the, ask the right questions at the time of Watergate? Every member of the Watergate committee, with the exception of Sam Irvin, was receiving money from the Gulf Oil. This was admitted just last week, and even Sam Irvin, according to William Colby, was under control of the CIA. So how do we know that these 12 people aren't hand-selected, that they'll ask the wrong questions, that they'll call the right witnesses? Therefore, every witness that's there that they choose to call, and they can ask any question they want, but then a researcher should be able to step right in and cross-examine that particular witness and say, challenge their documentation as against the historical record of the bound 26 volumes plus the National Archives documents that we researchers have. We should be able to stop a lie from being perpetuated after one other lie and one after the other. Like we had the Warren Report that was a lie. The Rockefeller Committee was filled with falsehood and lies. Senator Church's committee was another trail of innuendos and lies. And then uh, Mr. P Representative Pike's committee closed up, and the CIA closed that up without getting a bit of evidence out about the CIA or hardly any. So now they're going to the Kennedy assassination. There's absolutely no reason to believe, knowing the list of people that I tentatively have heard are going to be on the committee now, that they can ask an intelligent question to get an honest answer. Therefore, those people who have worked a long time, published articles, and done research 12 years or more, people like Sylvia Marr or uh, Mary Farrell in Texas, Sylvia's in New York, or myself, who uh, we three women have cross-filed those 26 volumes, we would know if somebody on the stand is telling a lie and whether it's true or false, and we should be given that opportunity to clarify it. The next thing I uh, suggested was that that committee has to be prepared for planted documents and falsified reports. And that, again, gets into challenging these people and having uh, experts not affiliated with government, private experts, because out of the National Archives can come documents about Fidel Castro. There can come documents about Jack Ruby and his links to Castro Cubans in New Orleans when it was actually David Ferry and the CIA and the anti-Castro Cubans. E. Howard Hunt's been in jail too long. All the other Watergate people are out except G. Gordon Liddy. Hunt uh, was being given a million dollars cash so he wouldn't have to go to jail. Richard Nixon was afraid he'd talk about all the seamy things he'd done for the White House. He's sitting down there in uh, Florida, and we have no way of knowing whether or not he's falsifying documents right now. He could be working night and day with razor blades and typewriters and State Department documents because... Uh, he, they acknowledge that he forged the documents of DM's murder in Southeast Asia to blame Kennedy, that the Pentagon and State Department gave Hunt these documents. So the thing, the point that I want to make is that uh, they could be producing new documents. And before the committee takes this testimony of James Hostey um, saying that he flushed down a letter by Lee Harvey Oswald, he should be asked on the stand why Lee Harvey Oswald wrote a letter to the Russian embassy just three weeks before he was dead, saying that Agent Hostie had seen his wife, and he said, I don't trust the notorious FBI, and Hostie's up to some mischief. He's offered my wife citizenship and a visa to this country. The FBI can't give passports and citizenship, and certainly not three weeks before John Kennedy was killed. Why would Agent Hostie visit Marina Oswald in order for her citizenship? So the new planted documents could be presented and falsified, just like that Mormon will of Howard Hughes that was found up in Salt Lake City. Uh, there's no way for researchers after 12 or 13 years to protect themselves against this kind of thing. So every document that's produced now has to be challenged for its authenticity, for its ink, for its splicing, and let experts not affiliated with the government see if these are tampered with documents that uh, are being falsified at this time. Another thing is that the staff and lawyers should not have any CIA secretaries or legal help from the CIA. That was the trouble before. The entire CIA ran the Warren Commission hearings. The pregnant secretaries were brought in. The archives uh, documents that they had were delivered to CIA staff. And John Kennedy said uh, he was quoted in a book uh, 
called Crisis and Credibility. It's a hell of a way to learn things, John Kennedy said. But after the Bay of Pigs invasion, he said, I've learned one thing from this business, and that is we have to deal with the CIA. So therefore, there should not be any CIA staff members investigating Kennedy's assassination. Well, I have some other suggestions for the committee. I may read them to you next week and run them down with you. We'll do some more on Robert Hall. Our time is out now, and you take care. This is May Brussel, Dialogue, Conspiracy in Carmel, California, and this is September the 20th, 1976. This has been Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist May Brussel, who for many years has been researching the facts behind political assassinations and conspiracies in this country. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KLRB-FM in Carmel, California.